one of my questions also, uh, you were talking about the Green New Deal, which was actually stolen essentially by progressives and then watered down. Uh, yeah, thanks, AOC. But one of the things I wanted to ask you was about part of the Green New Deal that Dr. Joe Stein also has uh, also includes a federal jobs guarantee. Uh, can you lay that out just from a 30,000 foot uh, view of what that means for the average worker? Well, the loss of a job is a big fear that the system instills in workers to get resistance against the Green New Deal. But I would promise to never support any changes where people would lose their job or lose the quality of their job. In other words, the challenge of transforming our economy, transforming the world to protect us from climate change, the challenge is so huge that we could employ mil millions of people transitioning to a, a green economy. Mm -hmm. And those jobs would be in the infrastructure that's needed to um, transition the economy away from the oil-based uh, one that we have now. <laughs> Look, you know, the, the alphabet agencies, I think they were trying to mess up and mess with our connection because for some reason they were just like, ah, I see what you're doing. So, well, you know, sometimes, sometimes I think that, and then I find out that it was just me. <laughs> it's okay. It's all right. Oh, no. So, now, you are currently running for Senate in Arizona, U.S. Senate, under the Green Party. Uh, and one of the things that I actually wanted to ask you first is, why are you running for Senate? What is the main motivation uh, behind this that, uh, that you have for running? That's an easy one. It's Gaza. I can't stand still and not do anything I can to help the Palestinian people in Gaza. Mm -hmm. I think what we're doing there, you know, we're all accomplices because it's our tax money and it's being spent to provide the bombs, to pro provide the white phosphorus, the munitions. And, and there are representatives that are defending the Israelis anytime they're trying to be held accountable by the International Court of Justice. So it, it just really wounds me you know, to pick up the phone or get online and see the pictures of the children, you know, being dug out of homes that have been f flattened or dragged out of tents that have been burnt. So I had to do something. I mean, not that I wasn't uh, enthusiastic about the Green Party platform and Jill Stein's campaign. Yeah. Because I am. You know, there's some existential threats that need to be addressed. And uh, cl climate change and the permanent war, uh, economic uh, drive that we're on, and uh, but I'm not a spring chicken, and I realize I have limitations. However, without going into it too deep, deeply, I'm, uh, I'm the one that stepped up to to run against uh, Ruben Gallego and Carrie Lake in Arizona. And the stake is real high. Stakes are real high, but. Because as you know, they're supposed to be running neck and neck. And uh, the uh, Democrats or the Republicans will control Congress based on the results of this election. And maybe some others, but this one definitely plays a role. So th that's why I'm running. I mean, mm -hmm. Gallego's office called me Gallego he was, uh, himself at, asked me to... Uh, his office asked me to to resign and go away because they're they don't want Carrie Lake and Trump to to win. You know, they think the world will be horrible. And I understand that. You know, my daughter one of my daughters told me the same thing. Dad, you don't know what this means to us, what this means for us. If Trump gets in and my daughter's black, and I said, I do, honey, but I just really don't don't have the answer. The only thing I know is I couldn't look at a Palestinian in the eye and tell him I voted for a genocider. And yeah. both of those guys 
Carrie Lake and, and Ruben Gallego and, and Harris and Biden and Trump, they're all going to continue this genocide. Yeah. And this is, a, this is an act that wounds us to our soul, wounds me to the heart. We just cannot stand by and let that happen. Now, if it turns out that black people and brown people, I'm a, I'm a brown person myself, mm -hmm. uh, you know, get it, have it a little bit harder on the retaliation from Trump, then that's what we have to fight for. You know, Trump is promising to deport 10 million people. I might be one of those because I was born in Mexico. Mm -hmm. The only, so I'm kind of like a half immigrant because I came to this country with, with my parents, of course, mm -hmm. when I was four years old, as soon as I learned to swim. And uh, that's not really true. The Rio Grande River hardly ever runs that high. But uh, I came when I was four and uh, I've been here all my life. This, this is, this is my country, but you know, you never, you never really remove yourself from Mexico because yeah. parts of this country, even here in the Southwest, you can go into some towns and in the Rio Grande Valley in Texas and, and not have to speak English. As you know, the whole territory was conquered yeah. in 1845 by the U.S. states from back east. They wanted this, they wanted this part of the country to continue to become be a slave state. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that's why I'm running. It's mainly because I I want to do anything I can to stop the, the murder, the torture, the car carnage, the extermination of the Palestinians. And Harris is not going to stop it. If you look mm -hmm. into it, she's she's going to continue it. And so will Trump. So we've, we've got to realize it, that no matter who we vote for, U.S. capitalism is the same. You know, they're going to elect they're going to elect some figurehead to run it for them. But it's going to continue onward because they have yeah. no choice. Yeah. Go ahead. One well, you actually was talking about uh, what's happening in Gaza is one of your main motivations, which I, I applaud. Uh, in fact, this is actually one of the tweets that actually came out a couple of days ago. This says the Ministry of Health in Gaza has just published a 649 page document with the name, age, gender, ID number of every Palestinian killed in Gaza from October 7th to August 31st that it has info for over 34,000 out of 40,000. The first 14 pages of pages of this list are ages listed as zero or under one years old. These are the pages and pages of lists of names of people who were murdered by Israel since Babies. October 7th. Babies. Yes. But you know, they as they say, Israel has a right to defend herself. It's herself. But mm -hmm. Israel does not have a right to break international law. It's an illegal mm -hmm. occupation in the first place. The Palestinians have a right to defend themselves against an illegal occupation. And Israel does not have a right to defend its illegal actions. If they're in Gaza, they do not have a right to defend themselves against their illegal incur incursion, illegal bombing, illegal extermination of the Palestinians. Go ahead, I, I interrupted you. No, 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 you, 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 were, you were cooking. Um, <laughs> so. I appreciate it. But, you know, on, honestly, uh, you know, people uh, like your opponents uh, would still toe the party lines. You know, they would toe the party lines, whether it's the liberal, uh, the, the liberal Zionists, which is the J Street types. Right. You have the J Street people who are, you know, even people like Jamal Bowman, who recently lost his primary. He is a recipient of J Street, I think around $2,500. But then you'll have the Kerry Lake types that will be a, a, an IPAC uh, recipient, or you know, they, they would be favorable to people like her. So ultimately, you know, you have the liberal Zionist or the conservative Zionist, but either way, you still get Zionism, which is settler colonialism, which is causing 
what's going on in not just Gaza, but also in West Bank as well now. And so it's just, you know, goes to show that the Israel project really is an illegitimate project that should not be uh, continued, uh, you know, in, in, in so far as, you know, taking away the rights of the people who have been there. And so this is what we see today as well. Israel is a garrison. It's a garrison fort. Remember back in the cowboy days when the U.S. military would go out west and, you know, massacre a bunch of Native Americans and then have a fortress fort from which they would do incursions out into mm -hmm. the land? They would protect the fort. They would protect the garrison. Israel is the same thing. It's a partnership between Zionism and imperialism. And the empire is always growing, always wants to, you know, capture new markets and new resources and control. Mm -hmm. We don't we don't need the oil in the Middle East. But we, the U.S. government, I say we it's not we because those aren't my interests. I don't have any interest in exterminate exterminating the Palestinians, although they will try to tell us that it's our interest that they're defending. We don't have interest there. The oil companies and the military industrial complex has interest, but we do not. I would much rather have a brotherhood of understanding and cooperation with the Palestinians than massacre yeah. their children or the Iraqi children or the children in Afghanistan or any of the children in those regions. They're, they're wonderful people. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I think about uh, there was a, a discussion. Uh, my RBN colleague, uh, comrade Sabi Sab, she actually had uh, an interesting panel on a couple weeks back. Uh, and they were talking about what's going on in Gaza. And they were talking about immigration. And one of the things that was said was, well, if you continue to keep these areas destabilized, what do you think the immigrants are going to come? They're going to come here and then they're going to need resources because they're going to be refugees. The thing is, is like, how do you prevent refugees from coming? Well, you make sure where they're at is safe for them, but they can't be safe if you're constantly supplying that area with weapons. You cannot, you know, keep them safe in that area if you're constantly backing uh, a settler colonial project or if you're continuing to sanction an area or destabilize an area. And so... The thing is, it's like it's like you guys do not want uh, brown, black and brown people immigrating here, but yet you want to still keep on destabilizing the areas where they live that keeps them coming here. It's like, which one do you want? You know, and ultimately, if you want them to be legal immigrants, all right, fine, then stop, you know, making their areas into hell holes. Why? Because you guys want oil? You know, and, and the crazy part is, and now I'm starting to go on up in the tangent, but my thing is, is like, if we get ourselves off of the dependence of fossil fuels, which is what a lot of, which is pretty much the, one of the main, you know, tenants of the Green Party, then if we're not on any fossil fuels, then why are we in the Middle East anymore? People don't leave home unless your home is the mouth of a shark. And that I quote a poem that's been circulating yeah. by this lady poet. I think her last name is Shire. And uh, it's a beautiful poem. It's called Home, the poem. And it's, it's wonderful. It explains why people leave their home. They don't want to leave. But mm -hmm. we've been pushing people out of Venezuela since we, we, there I go, we again. U.S. Empire has been pushing people, create, creating refugees from mm -hmm. Venezuela mm -hmm. since, since the early 90s. You know, we caused that wave of refugees from Central America with those illegal wars under the Trump regime, under Oliver North, where we were trying to overthrow Nicaragua, overthrow El Salvador, overthrow Guatemala. You know, we even started the war on drugs in Mexico, which the terrorism that resulted from that has also pushed people out. 
NAFTA pushed people out of Mexico. And they knew that NAFTA was going to do that. But they did that. They wanted the, the people who were self-sufficient in their farmer lands, they wanted to go to the city and fill the, the, those low-wage maquiladora plant jobs. And then also be closer to the border and make, make their way and provide cheap labor on this side of the border. That's a very sore spot with a lot of labor people. All those Mexicans coming over here, taking jobs that no one else will take. The solution to that is to organize them, turn them into union members. Mm. Good, solid union members will not scab on other union members. Yeah, I, I've, been I, union, I've been in unions my entire life. Started out in high school, with retail clerks, you know, sacking groceries in a uh, grocery store. Went on, got a job with the telephone company, joined Communications of America, went on to, to the electric company, joined International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers. Years later, I moved to Arizona and uh, got a job in a steel steel foundry in Arizona. I was a ladle operator. I poured molten steel into uh, molds that made little grinding balls for for the copper mines out here. So it was it was hot, hotter than hell in Arizona, pouring molten steel. But I joined the steel workers union because every day you went to work, you, you held your life in your hands because that's how dangerous that, that job was. Yeah. But that job shut down and uh, you know, some some depression in the economy shut it down. That was in Phoenix. I moved to Tucson, got a job at uh, Hughes Aircraft, which has now become Raytheon, which is one of the biggest missile manufacturing companies in the world. And I worked there for 30 30 years and I went I went in I was in the socialist group at the time so I went in to build a nucleus of revolutionaries inside the plant wow. and our, so I was an anti-war and an environmental activist inside Hughes aircraft and later on Raytheon but I didn't break the law you know, we went in there, we exercised our freedom of speech rights to raise consciousness, let people know that everything they read in the paper, a lot of it was not true, that there were things going on like Nicaragua, El Salvador, Guatemala, Venezuela. And, uh, you know, I didn't start a revolution, but I was a, jo a shop steward. I def defended people against the dangerous conditions on the job. And I helped to organize when we did organizing drives. You know, I organized chicken workers in Idaho as a result of being in the machinist union. It's a good union. Mm. Wow. Thank you very much for that history as well. Um, you know, and so this actually takes me into wanting to get into your policies that you have currently on your website. Uh, this is, and I'll also make sure to put your, your website in the, the chat as well for people, but it's Green Party, uh, Eduardo Quintana for U.S. Senate from Arizona 2024. Um, and as far as, uh, your, uh, your policies, you know, it says grassroots democracy, social justice, nonviolence, ecological sustainability. Uh, so you are uh, essentially with Dr. Joe Stein and saying that you are pro-worker, anti-war, climate action agenda. Uh, and so uh, this right here, uh, you go basically according to the Green Party platform. Uh, so you say grassroots democracy, all human beings must be allowed to say, have a say in decisions that affect their lives. No one should be subject to the will of another. We will work to improve public participation in every aspect of government and seek to ensure that our public representatives are fully accountable to the people who elect them. We also work to create new types of political organizations that will expand the process of 
participatory democracy by directly including citizens in decision making. So, uh, you know, you're talking about actually put putting uh, more of it grassroots. Now, as far as policy, uh, if there was a bill that came across your desk that essentially would uh, gut Citizens United and restore, uh, uh, also uh, repeal, uh, repeal Citizens United and also restore uh, the taking money out of politics. How, you know, how would you vote on that? And what type of also other contingencies that you would put in place uh, as far as taking money out of politics? Well, I would, of course, sign that bill. And then I would go out and campaign for it. And I would turn the uh, House into an organizing hub to make sure that it's defeated. Whether we know it or not or don't understand, we're in a class war. And the ruling class is winning. The people that used to be lobbyists, they're now in office. The lobbyists for, for Wall Street, for the banks, for the oil, oil companies, for the polluters. They're now in government. Trump's a billionaire trying to piss, pass himself off as a blue collar worker. I mean, that's preposterous. When we realize that both of these parties are two sides of the same coin, easy cop and hard cop, two sides of the same bird, it's a vulture, start organizing a working class party that's independent of these two because they represent the class that's abusing us, that's destroying the uh, environment, that's creating, putting, bringing us closer to nuclear war with Russia or China or Iran or North Korea. As soon as we realize that we need our own political representation, because these guys go back and forth. That's why Gabby, uh, not Gabby, uh, What's her name that just crossed over to supporting Trump? Trump. Tulsi Gabbard. That's why Tulsi Gabbard could easily go from being, I'm a radical. Yeah, I'm an anti-war radical. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, never mind. I'm a right-wing Trumpist. And so could uh, Jay, you know, Robert F. Kennedy. One day people are thinking, gosh, should we endorse him? I mean, he, he he's like us. He's really a real... Progressive, what the hell is a progressive? You know, Robert F. Kennedy can, can just jump ship and join uh, Dick Cheney and be comfortable in the Democratic Party. We have no party right now. We're the majority of the people in th this country. We're the majority. If we decided to tomorrow to go out there and vote for Jill Stein, she'd win. And she has a program that addresses our needs. She's pro-union, pro-environment, pro-women's rights, pro-everything. Check out the program because that's what I, I'm using mostly is jillstein2024.com. And she's got it listed out in detail what the Green Party campaign under Jill Stein for president represents. So we, could win that. we could win if we didn't fall for the BS that old oh, Trump will get in. There's not that much difference. There's no, there is difference. There are sig significant differences, but not, not fundamental differences. So uh, you, you basically what you're saying is that you also want to work on a Steinware agenda that pushes forth, uh, you know, a lot of the policies that she has laid out on her website. Is that what I'm getting her, correct? Her agenda is my agenda agenda with some okay. minor cosmetic differences and uh, okay but it's the same agenda okay so with that being said uh just to ask you a couple of questions off of her agenda one of the things that i also wanted to get into was about workers because a lot of times and i'm not saying this as my my own personal opinion one of the issues I find, especially in this country, is that there are some people, some citizens in this country, that aren't too 
it's uh, what's happening in Gaza isn't exactly on their particular radar. That's intense. What's on their radar is the the economy, how much it costs for food. Uh, rent prices are skyrocketing. Uh, you have these corporations that are stiffing us left and right. One of the things I wanted to ask you about is wages. Uh, you said that Dr. Joe Stein's agenda is your agenda. Are you on board for a $25 an hour minimum wage for workers in this country? Absolutely, at least here here in Tucson, that would that would be uh, okay to start off with. Now you go to places like New York City or Chicago or LA, it might have to go higher. Okay. But if if we if uh, I was elected, I would immediately start pu pushing for raising the minimum wage to twenty five or thirty thirty dollars. Mm, I, okay. I would also introduce a motion to uh, to have everybody's basic needs met. At at the end of the day, we cannot have people out there that are hungry. I was I was in a mall the other day, outside the mall, and I saw a young woman eating out of a big trash can. She'd go look around, make sure no one was looking, look in, and then reach in and grab something. I don't know what it was. And then she'd scurry off into the bushes, and I could see her eating it. And then she'd come back and get another chunk, maybe an old pizza or something. That is outrageous. That is outrageous. We've got little girls you know, here 12, 13, 14, prostituting themselves down on South Six because they need to help the family. That is outrageous in the richest country in the world. And we don't, we don't have health care for everybody because the Democrats al allowed the insurance companies to get in and mess up, you know, the uh, health care system. We have more people that have access to health care, but the co-pays are too high. The price of food is too high. The rent's too high. The price of housing is too high. The speculators are owning the, the market. My campaign would guarantee housing for everyone. It would guarantee food for everyone. Health care for everyone. Clean water. Clean air. All the basics, Medicare for all. I can't, can't guarantee that we'll get it, but I guarantee that we will fight for it. My Senate office would be an organizing hub for everyone that wants to, that wants those things. You know, we'll go out there and we'll march. I believe in mo mobilizing, you know, people in the working class. That's where the power is. It isn't in re reforming the system. We can get some minor reforms if we put enough heat on them, but we're not going to get fundamental reforms. And we need fundamental reforms because actually I, be I believe that capitalism is incompatible with a climate crisis. When you have to negotiate with Republicans that don't even believe that the earth is getting uh, hotter, that the seas are getting poison toxic, that the air is becoming caustic. There's no time to waste. We got to move on this. We got to have a, an emergency mobilization throughout the whole country to save the earth. I believe that. I read the, the science reports. If someone can, can show me that I'm a lunatic or I'm wrong, I'm open to that too, because I'm a rational person. But this is what's happening. We're closer to nuclear war. We're closer to climate, you know, annihil annihilation of our species. We got to move. We don't have time to f fool around with these lunatics that don't believe in science. Yeah, one of the things that uh, it kind of trips me out is that uh, the Republican Party used to be the party of conservationists. I think back to, te to Teddy Roosevelt how he was a huge conservationist and wanting to make sure that the environment was, you know, taken care of, especially, in, in, you know, establishing, you know, national parks across this country so that we can have natural areas and where we could, 
you know, uh, you know, experience the beauty of the land. We can fish, hunt, uh, you know, we can, uh, we can camp, uh, we can do all these different things. But as we can see now, this, uh, you know, both the Democratic and Republican parties are really anti-planet, anti-environment as, because, and, and one will say, well, it's not an issue at all. We don't have to worry about it. And the other will say it is an issue, but they'll still keep contributing to the problem. Uh, one of the things that I keep thinking about right now is what's going on with uh, a lot of the indigenous activists and protesting line three. You also have the Willow Project that was approved by people like Joe Biden. And now you have Kamala Harris that said she did a full reversal heel turn on her support for fracking. Uh, I guess a, I, I'm assuming correctly that you are against fracking. Absolutely. I am for the plant. And I am for the people, and I am for peace. An environmentalist, he likes to go out and shoot, you know, nature, and and his his hunting partners too, if he gets a yeah. chance. But um, when it comes to taking a hit on Wall Street or the military industrial complex, you lose them, you know. So if it's a question between continuing to support permanent war which the U.S. economy is based on, then we lose those Republican environmentalists. They don't understand that the military is the worst polluter in the, in the world and will continue. We mm -hmm. have to tra transition away from a military economy, from the military industrial complex. That's where the money's gonna come from for, for a Green New Deal you know, for subsidizing people who can't afford health care or can't afford food or can't afford housing. The money's going to come from raising taxes on the billionaires yeah. on Wall Street and bringing, transitioning away from the military industrial co complex. You know, we have 800 bases throughout the world, 800 bases out there they're going to get us into a nuclear war. So we have to begin to shut that down, that whole industry where the, our tax money is recycled through the military and back to Wall Street, but through the purchase of, of military, you know, uh, products. So. Great. One of my questions also, uh, you were talking about the Green New Deal, which was actually stolen essentially by progressives and then watered down, uh, yeah, thanks AOC. But one of the things I wanted to ask you was about part of the Green New Deal that Dr. Joe Stein also has, uh, also includes a federal jobs guarantee. Uh, can you lay that out just from a 30,000 foot uh, view of what that means for the average worker? Well, the loss of a job is a big fear that the system instills in workers to get resistance against the Green New Deal. But I would promise to never support any changes where people would lose their job or lose the quality of their job. In other words, the challenge of transforming our economy, transforming the world to protect us from climate change, the challenge is so huge that we could employ mil millions of people transitioning to a, a green economy mm -hmm. and those jobs would be in the infrastructure that's needed to um, transition the economy away from the oil-based uh, one that we have now so it would also mean that uh, jobs in healthcare because everybody would have guaranteed health care mm -hmm. so uh, without going into it any deeper than that, no one's job would be threatened or or underpaid. We wouldn't make the change if it meant people were going to lose their jobs. We could do that, you know, a little bit at a time as we were able to get people into jobs and stabilize. Same so, thing with uh, immigration. Immigration is another fear topic that's thrown out there to scare people. I mean, look at Trump. He runs a 
or nothing but fear that the Haitians are going to eat your do dog or your cat or your goose if you let them live next door to you. I mean, in that sense, Trump is a very dangerous lunatic because he's intentionally creating fear that's going to have consequences on black people. Mm -hmm. Like yeah. those poor Haitians. I'm just waiting to pick up, you know, turn up in the news and see that something, some some lynching's gone on or some horrible crime's been committed against those poor Haitians that are here mm -hmm. because they couldn't live in Haiti because we've inter intervened. Look up the history of U.S. intervention in Haiti. Mm -hmm. I don't know that they've gone five years without a U.S. intervention since 1812 when they, I, around there when they kicked the French out. Yeah. Honestly, about the date. No, uh, you know what? Uh, the thing is, it's like a lot, of, and, and there's pictures going online. And unfortunately, it, it is from some black Americans that say, uh, well, look at where they came from. It's, 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 you know, completely, you know, trashed. And my question to them would be, well, who, who actually, you know, caused it to be that way? Because the thing is, is that a lot of times people will say they will try to blame the way the country is on the people, but you're, they're not seeing who's intervening. If you want to see why uh, Haiti is in the state that it's in, you may want to ask France, Canada and the United States as to why France is at. I'm sorry, as to why uh, Haiti is actually in the state that it's in. And then if you want to ask them, then you just ask uh, Burkina Faso, Niger and Mali ask them why uh, their countries, you know, they weren't able to get ahead like they wanted to as well. A lot of times, you know, this is what happens when you have people who are not uh, abreast uh, when it comes to geopolitics and what has actually happened. They do not study history. And, you know, as the old saying goes, those who do not study history are doomed to repeat it. And so if you're going to say, you know, uh, well, look at these people and they're coming here and doing all these horrible things, it's like, Number one, uh, has actually, you know, you know, we have a little enough age of phones. I haven't seen that. I haven't seen any video of it. Number one. Number two, uh, people who are coming here are coming here because their country is destabilized. Well, why is their country destabilized? And so this is a whole nother thing. But, you know, going back to uh, what you were saying about uh, the, you know, Green New Deal and federal jobs guarantee, one of the things that it kind of makes me think about was during World War II, um, I think there was Dr. I'm sorry, Professor Richard Wolf was actually talking about this, where in World War II, right before we had the biggest collapse in our history, right? Capitalism had failed, essentially. And so in order to save capitalism, a federal jobs guarantee actually happened. And it was men were drafted into the, into the war. And then for the other people that weren't drafted into the war, they were hired to be able to uh, make the uniforms and make the machines that were needed for war. So basically the entire country was put back to work, but it was done through war. And from what it sounds like to me is you're saying that we're going to do the same thing, except for it's going to be for the climate instead. So we're going to move from war to uh, of nations to war against climate change and start hiring people there. Is, is Am I correct on that? You're absolutely correct. We'd go from an economy of destruction to an economy of construction to make this a better world for everyone. We'd be working to save lives, not end lives especially the children. What Trump is doing is a particularly wicked twist on divide and conquer. He's trying to get the American working class to fight who are suffering. I recognize that they are, we are suffering. I personally am not. I'm lucky. I'm, I'm doing good. But I know that other people are hurting. And uh, what Trump is doing is trying to pit them against other people that are hurting. But the American working class has more in common 
with a Haitian immigrant, with a Mexican lab labor, who are being hurt by the same forces of capitalism, of imperialism, the U.S. government and their corporate sponsors. We, we have more in common with a Haitian immigrant than we do with Trump, who's a billionaire, who's trying very skillfully to pit us against each other so that we don't focus on the real cause of our problems, which are the people that run Wall Street and, and, and bring in money from the military industrial complex and the oil companies. Those are the ones that we should be focused on in fighting. Those are the ones that are in charge. Democrats and Republicans have been in charge for over a hundred years. Yeah. We are the majority. We are the working class. I know they try to disguise it by saying middle class because they don't want us to say working class, but we're the working class. And if we band together, we can change this system from one that destroys people and the world to one that constructs the world, saves the world. We're close. We're close to going over the edge to a point of no return. You know, the ice caps are melting. The glaciers have melted for the most part. I went looking for one before my wife died about three years ago. We couldn't find one out there. Mm -hmm. But uh, so, go mm -hmm. ahead. Well, I was also I was going to ask you, uh, you know, uh, as far as uh, wanting to move on to some other topics. One of the things that I also wanted to ask you about was, uh, as we can see now, there are many cop cities that are being built uh, throughout the United States. You have uh, cities, cop cities that are being built in places like Atlanta, where the cities are ran by Democrats. And so you have uh, somebody like Kamala Harris that's very pro-cop, pro-police, that actually wants to maintain and keep the system of policing as is. Uh, you have people like Donald Trump that, of course, uh, is endorsed by basically the thin blue line. As far as uh, your support uh, for people, especially a lot of black and brown people that are disproportionately affected by uh, the criminal justice system, or as some people can say, the criminal injustice system, uh, what type of policies do you propose that would actually be a benefit for those of us that are black and brown in this country as far as criminal justice is concerned? And mass incarceration. That is what we believe in. You know, I noticed this morning that they arrested P. Diddy. And uh, yeah. I was trying to figure out what the heck they had on him. He looks to me like a successful, you know, black man, very smart who's made a career to get rich and he's gotten very, very rich. Well, mm -hmm. he's going to be made a, a lesson of no matter how successful or how rich you think you are. When we come calling you, it's to tell you that you got to get back in your, pl in your place. Mm -hmm. You're not going to be allowed to be successful and powerful in this country. And they're not talking to Pete Diddy. They're talking to everybody, all black people, and brown people in this country, that they can reach out and grab a successful black man like Pete Diddy and put him back, back in his place. I I necessarily wouldn't use Pete Diddy as a good example because he's accused of sexual assault. That's the, basically the, the gist of why he's been uh, uh, arrested by the FBI. Okay, I'll go with you. You probably know more about that than I do. Yeah, yeah. He's, plus, he, yeah, because he's a he's also he's a billionaire and he's exploited people to get to where he's at. I, you know, to be honest with you, like I also uh, am of the same opinion that the criminal justice system needs to be rebuilt uh, in, in a way that is actually more better for everyone that actually serves the people rather than uh, property. Mm -hmm. Um you know, uh, like one of the, the people who I think would be a, a prime example is somebody like Mumia Abu Jamal, who has been in prison, uh, you know, and been made an example of for basically speaking the truth. 
Um, you have people who are like George Jackson, who was in prison. You have Asada Shakur that's in exile in Havana. You know, uh, so there's there's a few examples that, uh, you know, that it is ap appropriate of what you said. You know, the system says, well, you cannot be successful in this country and be black or brown uh, when it comes to actually doing for the people. So, for instance, I, I think back to Fred Hampton. He was only 21 years old and he was murdered by the Chicago PD and in, in collusion with the FBI. And so, you know, as far as uh, that goes, uh, I definitely agree that, you know, when it comes to success and success in the in the more uh, broader term of helping the community, then yes, you cannot be successful, uh, whether black or white or brown, it doesn't really matter to them. Well, I, uh, I I could have used a better example, and I apologize to anybody that might have offended. It's okay. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, some, some, you know, a lot of people aren't abreast of of exactly the allegations against Diddy, and uh, yeah. So, but one of the things I also wanted to talk about is speaking of black people. Is one of the things that Dr. Stein has on her website. What, and I didn't find on yours just yet, but I, of course, yeah, I. I assume that you're still working on it, but is reparations, lineage-based reparations for African uh, for American descendants of slaves. Do you support it? And if so, why? Absolutely, we support reparations. And because for 400 years at least, we've been uh, stealing, you know, black labor. And uh, so there's not a lot of hereditary labor passed on generation to generation. I mean, slavery broke up the black family initially, and then Jim Crow continued it, and then institutionalized, institutionalized racism has continued it, continued breaking up the black family, especially with mass incarceration. So yes, we support reparations for all the people, all the injuries. I was taught growing up that when you do something wrong, you apologize, you make amends, and you promise never to do it again. Mm -hmm. And that, that I still believe in that. I believe we can do that as a country. And that was wrong. It was wrong to take, you know, black people, kidnap them from Africa, put them to work and take their wages, separate their families, sell their kids, we can never make up for that, but we sure as hell can try. So. That was a beautiful answer. Um, another question that I had was recently, um, now I'm gonna preface this by saying a broken clock is right twice a day, okay? But recently, uh, Donald Trump actually pro made a policy proposal saying that uh, under his administration, whether it's to be believed or not, was that he would make it so that anybody who works overtime, they do not pay a tax on any hour that's worked overtime. Do you think that that is a good policy or not? And if so, why? Yes, I think that's a good policy. And even though Trump pop popularized it, it was there. He tapped into it. But I don't think Trump will carry it out. I don't think it can. Uh, he can uh, be trusted to carry out his promises. Uh, he's a compulsive liar. I can only assume that he's continuing to lie. I don't know that the Democrats can be trusted to carry it out. And I, I understand that Kamala is not saying that. It's a popular idea. They're They're leaning towards what's called populism because they think it'll help them win the election. It may, but we have to remember that these are, these both these candidates are spokespeople for the, for the uh, Wall Street, for the oil companies, for the military industrial complex. That's not gonna change. They're just figureheads that the real rulers of this country, the funders of the, their campaign, APEC, 
They're figurehead spokespeople for APEC and the rest of the billionaires that own this country now. It's going to be a tough fight getting it back from them. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, speaking of which, as far as what um, I know, is that the Green Party only takes money from uh, the people. They are completely grassroots funded, which I know that you are. Um, one of the things that I also wanted to ask you uh, is really uh, regarding regarding uh, taxation. Now, of course, you'll be in the Senate, which is, uh, you know, going to be passing a lot of bills regarding taxation, uh, especially when it's carried over from the House. Now, uh, I know you want to cut the money that's coming into the Department of Defense, uh, the Pentagon, essentially. How much would you be willing to cut and what what number, what percentage wise would you be comfortable with as far as cutting the defense budget? As much as we can cut realistically because we have an offensive foreign policy mm -hmm. that o overthrows democratic governments all over the world, creates the, the refugee uh, drives that, that are coming up, pile, uh, piling up on the border, imposes economic conditions that destroy other countries' economies. And a lot of that is military. So we have 800 military bases. We would start reviewing those 800 military bases. And if they're not helping a country, which they aren't, then they're on the list to be cut. And uh, there's no limit to how many we can cut. So, but we, I don't think we can start off. That would be too disruptive. So, we would begin to cut the military industrial budget and put those people to work. That's another thing. We're not gonna put those soldiers out in the street without a job. You know, if we can find jobs for them, plug them into the new green economy, then we will shut down as many bases as we can do that. It'll take a little bit, a little while, take a lot of work. Would you be willing, or, or is that the same idea that you have for people, for instance, because you talked about the Green New Deal uh, and transitioning from a war economy to a green economy, would you be willing to do the same thing for people who work in oil rigs, for people who work, who are the ones on the ground actually doing the fracking and working with oil sands? Would you be willing to, uh, what type of program would there be for people who, uh, are working in the fossil fuel industry, uh, you know, because I know you say you didn't want to put soldiers out in the street, but what about those people who work in those industries? No, we wouldn't put them out of work either. That would be a real tough way of trying to to recruit, you know, believers in our policies, believers in our program by alienating them, by throwing them out in the street. We wouldn't do that either. To the extent that we could transition them from their oil company oil polluting fracking job into another another union scale wage job that's how we would that's how we would do it to the extent that we can then we will move if we cannot guarantee those uh fracking workers a union scale job union scale wages union scale benefits that's either in the private industry or it's either in the public works program, then we'd wait until we could. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, thank you very much for that. Uh, so as far as um, other questions that I have, um, I, I'm not gonna be able to get to them due to the sake of time, but uh, you know, just one more question in regards to uh, the, one of the things I wanted to bring up was uh, a couple weeks back, the Uhuru Three here in Florida have been put on trial by the Department of Justice 
for collusion with Russia. Uh, of course, uh, Chairman Omali Shetela, Penny Hessen, Jesse Neville have just been cleared of wrongdoing on official, uh, the official count of, uh, of being uh, Asian of Russia, but they're still, you know, under the this still under charge for the unofficial, uh, you know, unofficial agent of Russia. Basically, meaning they're not actually Russian agents, but somehow they say because they spoke, you know, against the sins of the American government, somehow they're complete concluding with Russia. Is that their reasoning? Uh, so, as far as they're concerned, this is really a free speech issue. And as lately, uh, actually, this was also covered by Kit Cavello from Harlan's Media earlier this morning about uh, about Max Blumenthal, uh, who is a uh, an award winning journalist, was just locked out of Twitter or X. What is your opinion about uh, the the freedom of speech? that we have, you know, especially with Julian Assange just being freed a uh, little over a month and a half ago. What is your opinion on that? And do you think that, uh, you know, Congress has had a little too much power in limiting speech, especially as far as uh, many of us on, on the left, especially? Well, it's gotten kind of uh, dangerously comfortable for some people to want to deny and cheer and clap whenever Trump is shut down or some of his right-wing allies, free speech is shut down. We have to be careful about that because if we let them get away with shutting down unpopular free speech, it's real easy for them. We're the real, we're the real targets. They flirted with the idea of charging Jill with similar type charges, being too too friendly with uh, Putin, being a Putin agent, mm. it's just another weapon that they that they use. And right now, we're really our free speech, our our, our Bill of Rights, is real under attack right now. They want to intimidate people and keep them from saying things that'll hurt their cause. But we're winning. I am convinced that we're winning. I had very little hope but still I, until I started seeing young people rising up and saying, wait a minute, that's not right. And they started mar marching, you know, against the uh, genocide. But the thing is, you can hardly find the ge genocide. You can hardly find uh, environmental crisis news anymore in the papers. They've turned the page, you could say. And now they're going after TikTok, which if it wasn't for digital media, like TikTok and, and your show, we would know what's go going on. We would be effectively bra brainwashed with a lot of viewpoints kept out of the public eye. I'm one of the three senator senatorial candidates in Arizona. I'm on the ballot. We had to collect 63,000 signatures to get on the ballot, but we did it. But now they're keeping me off the debate. One, because they're afraid I'll embarrass their two corporate candidates by bringing in a perspective that puts them on the spot. So right now they're keeping me out of the, out of the debate. And uh, it's, it's the Arizona, Citizens Clean Elections Commission, <laughs> which was a voter approved law. And, and but they're um they're gonna keep our perspective out of the public eye. I, I understand that the debate, excuse me, was gonna be tel televised nationwide, but it, it still is, but there'll only be two corporate candidates, Carrie Lake and Ruben Gallego on it. But the thing is, that's the power of our ideas. It's not me as a person. It's not, it, it has to do with the power of our ideas. And you cannot kill a good idea. You cannot kill, you know, our platform, our program. We, so 
keep in mind that we're winning. They're trying to pit us against other poor, poor people. We can't allow them to use that divide and conquer rule to pit us against each other. We all of us have to come together and unite and we can win. They're less than 1% of 1%. It's just a lot of pe people go along because they don't know any be better. Absolutely. One of the things that I wanted to bring up, uh, just for people who are interested in voting third party, and a lot of times we have a lot of people, you know, they send out many progressives to attack the third party and they'll say, well, they need to build a base, which uh, the third party has, you know, the Green Party has been building the base for a long time. They actually have been, uh, you know, I just recently, uh, I'm trying to reach out to the, the city controller of LA, who was a Green Party uh, member. So uh, I'm also trying to reach out to him to have him on. But uh, look, you have a chance now. And I said this uh, on Twitter, it says for people interested in Dr. Jill Stein and Butch Ware, if Joe Manchin and Kirsten Cinema are enough to hold back legislation or affect legislation in the Senate, then what can we do with two to four green senators? A small group of Republican Freedom Caucus members forced to vote for speaker against Kevin McCarthy. It doesn't take much for the Greens to get a small group in the House and have a caucus to cause change for people's agenda. I encourage you to vote green down ballot because, because the same platform is shared throughout and can make a big difference. Uh, you are literally one of those people who people can vote down ballot in Arizona. You literally are in a swing state. And so for people who say, well, you know, I want to vote for Dr. Joe Stein, but I'm only stuck with the Democratic Republican options in the Senate. No, you're not. You literally have a Senate option right here. Uh, so, you know, as far as voting down ballot, um, are there any, uh, I'm not, I didn't get to look, but are there any other uh, people that are Green Party that are down ballot as well in Arizona? It could be state uh, or local that you know of. We have about nine ca candidates in the state of Arizona. And, oh. and uh, so there are, and uh, I'm sorry, I don't have them memorized, but the information's available. Okay. All right, great. Thank you very much. I'll try to find that information so that I can submit it to the audience. But look, Mike, uh, see, I, sorry, go ahead. There's two <laughs> candidates that are very important. For Corporation Commission, the Corporation Commission can shut down those foreign mining companies that are poisoning our groundwater in Arizona. Oh. Bay Minerals, for, for instance, is digging up about four copper mines just right outside of Tucson. They're going to poison the aquifer. But there's a, fel there's a candidate from the Green Party named Mike Cease. If he's elected, he'll look into shutting them down, getting them kicked out of state. And back to Canada. And Nina Luxembourg, also another candidate for a corporation commission. And uh, we have, and we have a few more: Cody Hanna, and uh, five more after that. Okay. Well, if you are in Arizona, then you have some choices uh, outside the duopoly, which. I absolutely appreciate. And so also, if you can let people know, uh, you know, because we're about to head out, uh, what was your website and where can they could support you? The website is still under construction, mm -hmm. but we're using the Twitter site at uh, Quintana for Senate dot com. And we're using that to communicate. And the website will be up pretty pretty soon. So All I mean, right. the website is up. It's just not fully functional. I don't think there's a donate button on it. But you know what? We we haven't we haven't spent a lot of money and we haven't had to. And so we're doing good. Okay. All right. Great. Thank you so very much for joining. And I already put the, the link into the chat as well. Thank you so very much. For joining me, Mr. Eduardo. Well, thank you, Jay. Have a good day. 
Thank you. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thank you so very much for watching my channel, and I deeply appreciate it from the top and bottom of my heart. If you wish to support the channel further, so I can keep bringing you content that is educational and informative, you can become a patron on patreon.com forward slash jbfond. You can find that link in the pinned comment or in the description below. No matter what you give, you'll be supporting independent media and education that helps make the world better. Thank you so much, and you can watch more of my content here. Mwah. More head kisses, and have a beautiful day.